Yeah, we, 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 we ran into a geodynamical emergency. Um, on Monday, you were supposed to do some corn syrup and mineral oil simulations of subduction, but uh, Claudio discovered that his lithosphere is not going down. <laughs> and uh, Claud Claudio is not here, so I can make the, the joke now. I suggested that maybe you should just put the lithosphere at the bottom and we start studying plume dynamics. But, um, so that this, this, this emergency needs to be solved with the help of Michael Manga, uh, whose corn syrup is not going down right now. And he, he, won't, be here on the, he won't be here until Sunday, and, and we, we fear that it might not be, you know, I need to dry out the corn syrup or you know, do something, put pancakes on it. I have no idea. Um, and we, we thought that maybe it, it, it would be uh, too time critical to try to do that uh, tutorial on Monday. So what we are going to do is switch to two geodynamics tutorials. So on Monday, uh, instead of doing corn syrup, you'll be doing some computer modeling uh, using that uh, very large, complicated uh, Key and Wilson Terra Firma thing that you all uploaded on your computers, except for those who had this little bug problem. Um, so uh, instead of going to 365 on Monday, we'll just be having the meeting here. And then on Friday, we'll be doing the corn syrup in uh, Macon 365. I'll be sending out an email to remind everybody. And uh, there will be a few more instructions with both tutorials that you also get in that email. That, Jeff? That's me? All right. Um, thanks. So I guess I have the um, opportunity or the task of batting cleanup on a week of uh, exciting lectures about seismology and geodynamics and geochemistry and rheology and so on, um, which gives me sort of license to sort of say whatever I want. Um, so I thought I'd break this up into two pieces. Uh, one is just sort of a follow up on the seismology talks, and uh, these are more sort of opinions about things that I think are important. I think a lot of the methodological stuff has been covered. Um, some people might think they're cranky. And then I think then the core of it, the second half or two thirds, is going to be about trying to make this connection between things that we can observe with seismology and things that we'd like to know. Um, and you know, images like this, this is a scattered wave image across uh, southern central Alaska, for example. And you know, what does this actually mean about the Earth? Um, I see. So we always have. I think the tradition that we've established this week. This is an easy one. Some of you know these guys. This is this one. Some of you know these people. I know that and have worked with them. But um, so yeah, and so Jack Oliver and Brian Isaacs, right? So. Peter made this statement that seismology contributed nothing to plate tectonics. And, and um, I just want to point out this figure from this paper in 1967, I think, um, is arguably the first direct evidence that plates subduct. And, you know, what happened? Brian, guy in the bottom, which is the, how do you get the, this thing? Okay. Brian, um, you know, was sent to Tonga for three years with very primitive portable seismographs and ran around and recorded, you know, some of the first data from earthquakes in Tonga recorded nearby um, and discovered this remarkable thing that you can see just by looking at raw seismograms. This is a deep earthquake uh, in Tonga recorded back here near Fiji, and the seismograms that you see are you know, very you know, low amplitude, very depleted in high frequency energy, uh, very little energy there at periods uh, shorter than about a second or two, whereas uh, seismometers the same distance away, but up the dip of the slab, show a lot of high frequency energy. These look a lot like seismograms, they argued that you see propagating laterally an oceanic lithosphere. So they made the connection between these paths and um, sort of the high Q is the quality factor. Uh, higher the Q, the less attenuation there is. Um, this high Q path going up the slab compared to low Q paths in the back arc. And they argue that you know, this shows that this stuff is really this stuff going down. And I think you know, many people would argue this is sort of the last big piece in putting together plate tectonics. And it really comes from just staring at seismograms. 
And that's kind of the rant number one, is like it's really helpful to stare at seismograms. Um, but yes, I get to follow up on a week of good lectures that brings up a bunch of other black and white pictures of people uh, that sort of outline what this talk is going to be. Um, <laughs> so, oh, this is me. This is, this is I, I'm the, just this dumpster sort of trying to digest this whole like sequence of a you know, very informative, well-educated, and you know, I think technically advanced talks. So you're getting and trying to make some sense of how you sort of piece all this together. Um, <laughs> that's for next week. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, so, more seriously. So you know, we have a lot of tools. Uh, Doug and Brandon took you through a few of these for imaging subduction zones. Uh, some of them, uh, like tomography, where we look at volume average properties, tell us a lot about sort of large scale material property variations. And then others um, interact with interfaces and tell us a lot about sharp changes. And in subduction zones, it's actually a big deal because you know, we have this you know, fairly densely packed package of stuff going down where we expect pretty big material property changes, say, between well, there's no crust in this, but you know, a mantle and subducting sediment, crust and mantle underneath, and so on. And so, so I want to sort of focus a little bit on that more beyond what Brandon did, using a couple of these methods. And the first method is, you know, with this uh, teleseismic receiver function the method that you were introduced to, has been very successful. And then, but this, I'm going to sort of go back to kind of the Oliver and Isaac's approach here, which is it will stare at some seismograms. Um, this is a three components of ground motion vertical, and then, well, there's some misoriented seismometers. So, but this is apparently a, 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 the middle one is uh, in the direction back toward the source. This is an earthquake in Taiwan, and it's being recorded in Sandpoint, Alaska, which is just in the forearc of off the Alaska Peninsula. Um, and what you can see is, you know, the ground goes up and down, and then it. But then it goes side to side. At first, a lot like the vertical, there's a P wave. So the signal should just go up and down the ray path. But then something else obviously happens here that doesn't happen there. And you can see this really. And what we we'll argue is that this is you know, some of these other mode converted signals where we're starting to see stuff where the ground is moving horizontally instead of vertically. And that this is sort of the signal that's telling us about the Earth underneath. You can see this if you just take that vertical size around, turn it upside down, and lie on top. And these things, you know, match wiggle for wiggle up to around here. There's some deviation. And then, of course, there's this big deviation back here. These are lines are about five, are five seconds apart. So this is, you know, 10 or 12 seconds back into the record. Um, what we would argue by the timing of these, thinking about these being S waves generated by P waves and coming out more slowly, is that you know, these are these mode converted P to S signals off of different boundaries. And if you sort of just go through the typical velocities of waves, you say these things, this is likely a very strong signal coming off the top of a downgoing plate. Um, the, Crust is about 35, 38 kilometers thick here. Helen Janiszewski wrote a paper showing that uh, a few years ago. Um, and but we see again this much stronger signal that can't really be related to the upper plate crust. It's very big through some accidents of ray geometry. Um, but what we would infer from this is that there is an interface, a dipping interface, about 70 kilometers down. Um, and this works out. Whoop, there's a missing map in there. Oh well. Um, we, c we can analyze this, of course, using the signal processing. That's that same vertical and flipped over radial component. That's that high energy stuff. If we do sort of the receiver function tricks, we deconvolve this from this. We see you know, if everything was a P wave, these things would be identical. And the transfer function between this signal and this would just be a blip at 0. And we see a big blip at 0. But then there is another blip there. That's from the moho of the upper plate. Um, and then this other blip back here at seven or eight seconds later. This blip, the green line is a model where we just have this crust over the moho. And we can see, we can sort of explain some of them. But there's this big thing in here. And this is what we're arguing is the slab signal. And that's what's generating most of this stuff here. The point of going through this in great detail is you can just see this in the wrong raw seismograms. You don't have to do a lot of processing, but you feel much better about interpreting this stuff when you can do that. Um, right, so this is the cross section. There's the 
Pavlov volcano, Sandpoint is here, and the seismicity is about 70 kilometers deep beneath this. So, you know, the signals that we're seeing do a really nice job of showing that there's an interface right about where these earthquakes are. Um, and, you know, from that we infer earthquakes are on top of place. Same sort of principle. Um, this is, uh, Brandon and someone else showed some data from this uh, Mount St. Helens experiment, this IMUSH. This is the broadband array part of it. Uh, you know, it's our students' ring. And this is, again, signals from just one earthquake, but now it, we have probably about 80 ish odd stations running around Mount St. Helens back projected to the earthquakes, making some assumptions about what the mode conversion is that's generating these big signals. You can see, you know, just really strong. Uh, returns, in this case, the blips are showing um, energy coming from interfaces that produces the mode conversions. So you know, it's pretty obvious that there's a top of a slab, or you know, there's something dipping underneath there, and we can argue that this is the moho of the upper crust, and this is sort of where it fades out and gets complicated. That's Mount St. Helens, Mount Adams, and the back arc. But you know, the point is that you can see a lot without doing anything too complicated. Of course, the complicated stuff is nice. So this is, for instance, taking that same data set, doing you know, taking all the earthquakes, doing the full-blown uh, migration, splitting up the data set in two. So these are actually two different independent pieces. One is all the stations in the north, all the stations in the south, asking the questions about you know, continuity and consistency. And what we can see here is that you know, there's really strong evidence for a subducting plate that seems to be fairly continuous and 2D along strike. In this case, um, this is a result of this uh, Bostock Rondine 2D migration where the colors now are the seismic wave speed variations that you need in order to produce all those blips on the seismogram. And so in this case, what produces signal, and this is what's kind of subtle, are the sharp transitions from blue, which is fast, and red, which is slow. So, you know, big areas where not much happens, that we're not really producing much signal, it's, it's the transitions on these diagrams to look for. And we see something that looks like a boundary from fast to slow that would be easy to associate with the moho of the downgoing plate, and then something similar that's easy to associate with the moho of the upper plate. It looks similar. Uh, I think one of the big questions that we've been asking about these images is actually why we should see this at all, from what you know, Paul just described. Um, the seismic wave, the, the subducting crust should dehydrate, should metamorphose, should eclogitize, and I'll show you in a few slides. Eclogite should look an awful lot like peridotite to seismic waves. They're very hard to tell, but there still seems to be a few percent velocity contrast in this image here. And so, I, you know, it's one of the kind of <coughs> sort of things we're still trying to puzzle out is how we see this. And that's sort of what the second part of the talk is going to be about is, you know, how do we actually interpret this in terms of things that we'd be interested in. Um, there's a couple of other examples of, I think, successes with this kind of method. This is uh, back projecting receiver functions under Japan from this beautiful study that Kawakatsu did, uh, where his color scale is different. So the red blips now are these positive conversions, or something fast is under something slow. Um, the blue is a negative one. So you can see you know, what he's interpreting as the oceanic moho and the top of this plate things get sort of fuzzy at just near subarc depths. And there's you know, a lot of discussion about what is happening, what creates this top boundary, and how that changes. Maybe you're starting to see a layer of fluid rich or sort of pentonized stuff there. And then really noticeably in this particular image is this other interface that's you know, 60, 80 kilometers deeper that's inferred to be a subducting LAB, some evidence that correlates with stuff you see offshore. So these are also sort of some of the kinds of things that we can do. Um, we can occasionally, we, we have a hard time imaging very steep things with some of these methods because a lot of these rays bounce around and bend and fly out. Um, this is, I think, one of the, the deepest slab images that we've been able to recover using these kinds of scattered waves so down to at least 200 kilometers depth in Nicaragua. Um, a good question to ask is what is it that's generating these images? This is again one of these migrated uh, born migration thing. So the contrast between blue and red is what's generating the signals. And we can go back to the data and find the bits and pieces of the blips of the signals, align them. It's a little bit tricky because there's a lot of ray bending on something this steep to do. But if you do that, what you can see is that you know the moho and then the shallow parts of the interface look like 
you know, we start stacking up all the blips, are fairly sharp, impulsive things, about as sharp as we could see given how we process the data. But this deeper part of the boundary is actually something much broader and smoother. And when we compare this to thermal models, um, this kind of the sort of the amplitude and the sort of the gradients across here or the sharpness of this boundary consistent with us really just seeing the thermal boundary layer down deeper. So, you know, we have to be kind of careful in this to wonder how often are we seeing what is probably a material boundary in composition versus something that reflects sort of the relatively sharp thermal gradients on the tops of the slabs. Um, that's one set. Um, another thing we can do is, you know, there's all these different methods. We've shown a bunch of things like this uh, using this migration method. But, you know, back, this is a bunch of different sections from central Alaska where, you know, five different studies have analyzed the same different data set five different ways. You can see, like, different ones of these bring out different things. This one was an attempt to look at structure within the crust. So, you know, there's a lot of smearing in the slab itself becomes very hard to see. Um, some of these are just sort of simple attempts at getting boundaries. Some of these are trying to get migration. But the point is that there's a richness in things to look at. And you can learn a lot by you know, not just looking at the pretty fancy images, but thinking about the data that go into them. That's the rant. Um, I also want to spend a few minutes talking about Another kind of signal that I think is relatively underutilized in <coughs> subduction zone studies, but has a lot of promise because, well, it samples structures at a smaller scale. Um, and that's sort of relatives of the things we see in receiver functions, but generated by local earthquakes. Earthquakes, say, that are in slabs that are recorded just a couple hundred kilometers away where you can see smaller earthquakes, much higher frequencies propagate, uh, and you have the opportunity to look at much smaller wavelength structures if you can make sense out of these. And I, I would argue, you know, this sort of study, I think, is much more in its infancy in terms, I mean, people have known about these signals for decades, but in terms of the sophistication with which we think about them, a typical data, uh, you know, the kind of observation that makes you think this is worthwhile is something like this. This is, um, a record section, a signals from a bunch of seismometers, in this case from Hokkaido. There's the P wave, there's the S wave, there's some shifting in time. But importantly, at some distances and some stations, you see really big things coming in between the P and the S wave. Uh, that means they have to spend, you know, they're traveling at a speed to the station that's on average somewhere between P and S. Um, Look at that and look at the systematics of them. And a good candidate for them are mode conversions, phases that spend part of their life as P and part of their life of, as S uh, on the way to the station. And <coughs> what some of the studies, and I'll show you some examples in a minute, suggest that these things are actually mostly generated by conversions off of slab surfaces. Uh, this is just another example. This is from that same station in Sandpoint that made the receiver function. There's the P wave, there's an S wave, and there's these little blips. In this case, they're a little smaller, but they're pretty strong. This is up, down, and these are two other directions. And <coughs> the timing of these is such that they are credibly conversions from the top of the slab through some sort of process. The fact that they're there at all tells you there has to be some very strong velocity contrasts or scatterers at this surface at about the right point where we'd expect these rays to be. So that alone is telling us something important. This isn't just something that's been washed out, but there's a lot of structure preserved to depth. Um, uh, you can see these. This is from another study in Japan where a lot of these things have been best characterized. P wave, S wave. Um, here are the little blips. You can tell by the polarization. A lot of times these things show up as S waves, but because they come in before the S wave, they are credibly, you know, you probably have to have them spend part of life as P waves. Um, <coughs> the timing for slab models, in this case where we have a good idea where we think the slab is, um, suggests that uh, so the blue triangles are when this phase would be predicted to happen if the structure was, you know, in some sense one dimensional or simple. And um, what these guys find is that these things are actually coming in much later, farther and later. They come by you know, several seconds. That tells us that this P-leg, the part that's traveling presumably just below the slab surface, traveling up the slab, is slower than we might otherwise think. And um, this 
this result was shown before by Peter, but um, in this study by Sheena et al., uh, the Tohoku group, um, they've taken just the P segments of these legs, and ha they have so many of them, they can do tomography on them, and they can show that these paths that are traveling just below the slab surface um, are particularly slow between the volcanic arc and, well, the coastline where they run out of seismometers, and they can use that to infer um, some, some real interesting things about the nature of subducted crust. In particular, uh, this, these diamonds show sort of the average velocities inside this layer as a function of depth. The blue line shows an estimate of what uh, hydrated metagabro ought to look like. And what they see is that at least sort of in this depth range that's sort of 60 to 90 kilometers depth, these things are slower than we can credibly argue come from rocks. And so they argue that this is support for the presence of free fluids, free water in here. And there's also a peak in seismicity there. And so their model is that as the downgoing plate subducts, it's dehydrating, that's producing free fluids, that's triggering earthquakes, it's making the slab layer slow. In order to understand this and assess this, though, again, we need to have some good tools for understanding how to go from sort of material properties uh, to seismic wave speeds in a variety of ways. Let's see. So one last uh, Just thing. Just this is also the region that seems to be relaxing most quickly after the whole So there's a broad scale relaxation, and mm -hmm. this zone has the shortest time scales of relaxation geologically. That's interesting. <laughs> it is. Yeah, no, it is. I mean, it, this is also, well, when we talk about cold nose of the corners, this is sort of where this ought to happen. But, you know, this is, I'd say, you know, prob the one study that I think has really gone the farthest with these kinds of data. But these kinds of signals are seen all over the place. And, you know, I, I think that there's really a lot of opportunity to make much better use. We've been trying to tear them apart in Alaska. It, it takes a lot of work. These aren't sort of the normal things seismologists look at. But um, there's future. Another rel relative of these, and this is something that I used to work on, but I just wanted to show, to those, uh, is um, body waves that are, are called dispersed. Different frequencies of signals seem to show up at different times. Um, there's a great example of this. this is again, we're back in Alaska. There's a seismometer in Fairbanks, which is north of the subduction zone. This is sort of contours the slab. We look at earthquakes at 113 kilometers depth that are close by. This is underneath Mount McKinley. We see what you often see these little earthquakes. Like there's like a big blip for the P wave, and that's about it. If we look at earthquakes at the same depth in the slab, but down here under Cook Inlet, these signals travel a couple hundred kilometers just probably roughly horizontally along the top of the slab, much more complicated. So the, the, and they probably exit the slab near where this earthquake is. So the difference between these two signals has to tell us about propagation along the top of that slab. And what you see are these you know, much more complicated signals that are often characterized by low frequency early parts, followed by higher frequency later parts. And um, the inference here is that and this looks a lot like something that a uh, waveguide would produce. This is just an, um, <coughs> we see, you know, an easy way to think about this is that the low frequencies don't see fine scale structure, so they travel at the wave speed of sort of the mantle around, whatever it is. That's, and then the high frequencies get trapped in, in this case, some the crust or a part of the crust that needs to be continuous enough to allow this propagation to occur, is at least our argument. And if you go through the numbers, this layer is about 4 to 10 percent slow. So we're getting constraints on layers and seismic wave speeds that then we can compare to composition and so on. Um, there's not a lot of resolution that we're sort of averaging a few hundred kilometers long strike. Um, no one's really done that kind of in-layer tomography with these kinds of signals yet, although something that probably could be done. Um, but because of this long path, there's a lot of averaging, so there's a high sensitivity to exactly what these velocities are. Um, this is just another example of how you might look at this. Is now, it's not just Alaska. It's from Kamchatka showing this kind of low frequency early part of the P wave followed by high frequency. It's a very similar wave path in earthquake down the Kuriles propagating up from, in this case, about 200 kilometers depth. And you can make plots of sort of time that energy arises as frequency spectrograms and calculate and model this kind of dispersion, dispersion, different frequencies traveling in different ways. Um, and, oh, geez, 
sorry about that. <laughs> that was, no. Uh, so this is like an old slide from when I was trying to be cuter, I guess. But um, <laughs> So, I mean, the simple model is just this, that the high frequencies see sort of a low velocity channel that is you know, of a thickness comparable to or bigger than their wavelength. And the low frequencies are wavelengths that are much bigger than this thickness and don't see that. And that's kind of the simple way I've been thinking about this. Um, and you can do, you know, models of signals that are in or not in low velocity channels and reproduce some of the kinds of dispersion that we're seeing. But um, since we did this stuff, which was 10 or 15 years ago, um, a number of other people have seen similar observations. And I would say it's a little less clear that there aren't other mechanisms at work here. You know, one of the things that that model didn't explain was this fairly energetic coda. That is, there's a lot of high frequency energy lasting for a long time. So for instance, Furumoto and Kennett in this this incredibly complicated, I think they use as much computer power as they could find in 2005 to simulate scatterers that were little thin lenticular things. This is earthquakes in Izu and Bonin recorded all over Japan. Um, and, and, and able to reproduce a lot of the characteristics by having a fairly complicated heterogeneous laminated plate going down. And, and I think so there's been a lot of sort of back and forth about how important these kinds of processes are versus um, in the wave, but you know, if this is true, this is just a much more heterogeneous, say, mantle lithosphere subducting than we thought. And there's other variants where you know people are trying to find faults instead of water going into it, and so on, and so forth. Um, what's next? So that's kind of my rants about seismology in the first part of this. Um, before I segue into um, yeah, trying to make the connection, how we connect these sort of observations to things that non-seismologists care about. I mean, are there any issues, questions? Why did you put a metal paper upside down? I just stole it right out of Sarah's talk. I was like that way there. <laughs> so I, I was pilfering, I think that's from Sarah's talk, and that's from Christy's talk, and just <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, so right, so we'd like to think that, you know, these wave speeds that we're seeing in some way have something to do with the geology. In this particular case, um, I like this image because there's red and there's blue and we're pretty sure they mean different things in different places even though they're the same. So down here, you know, where we're below 50, 60 kilometers depth, we see this red blob, and you can see in the seismic areas, the top and the bottom of this are well defined. This is a layer, in this case, we think this is subducting crust that is, there's an oceanic plateau, the Yakutat terrain coming in here that is comparable in thickness. It's, you know, 15 to 20 kilometers thick offshore, and, you know, careful analysis away from shows too. And so the hope would be that, you know, does this change in wave speed somehow correspond to the changes that we would expect between, say, the rocks that we think ought to be going down there and the rocks that are going down here. It looks like it's the same thing here, but this is probably not the same thing at all. If we go and look at the seismograms that went into this, this is only two, three, four, five kilometers wide. This is surrounding the fault zone that ruptured in the great 1964 magnitude 9.3 9 by now earthquake in Alaska. Um, and so the thing that produces this signal probably has a lot more to do with uh, damage and destruction to the rocks or the subduction of sediments or something that happens at shallower depths. So, you know, there's, <laughs> with a P wave and an S wave speed, you can only learn so much. There are, what, 88 naturally occurring elements and five to 10,000 different mineral names out there. So um, we have to think carefully about what we can do. So, um, what affects wave speeds? And, you know, there's a lot of things here. Um, and I'll talk about each of these in turn. Uh, the most obvious is rock composition. Um, this is a plot from, I don't know, these sort of back and forth with Brad Hacker that we've been doing for years, where we take, um, in this particular case, we're asking the question is how does this 
say, a hydrated metagabra or metabasalt um, look to a seismologist when compared to, say, a mantle peridotite. So that's sort of velocity contrast we were just seeing here. So what's plotted here is the velocity ratio, the fractional change in velocity. Seismologists love things like d log p. This is just the change in velocity divided by the velocity, right? So um, this is 5%, 10% slower. And, eclogi so, and, and this is plotting, you know, what we've done is we've taken this composition, plugged it into one of these free energy minimization programs, in this case perplex, and calculated its equilibrium mineralogy if there's enough water there to fully hydrate it, and then calculated its elastic uh, properties and from that, and then the same thing to a peridotite. Um, so the eclogite that's up here at high temperatures and pressures is velocities are really almost identical to that of peridotites within a percent or two, depending on exactly the eclogite and the peridotites that you're worrying about. Um, but as you get to lower temperatures and pressures and you get into these hydrated assemblages that Sarah was talking about, you know, wave speeds can be quite different. They can be, you know, 10, 15 percent slower, which is a lot, you know, seismology is I think sometimes they can see a couple percent in some places, but these we should be able to see. Um, so that's one thing. Of course, that's not the only thing. Temperature itself matters, and we'll talk a bit about this. At high temperatures, the temperature effects get complicated because non-elastic processes having to do with attenuation creep in, and we'll sort of talk about how that works. And then I'll say a little bit about uh, as actually probably most important in the upper crust and may be important in places where melt is present. So a lot of um, effects of pore fluids. There's a huge um, literature and science of poroelasticity. Question. Yeah. Um, my question is the first, the diagram on the left, the velocity or dv, vp over v. Mm -hmm. um, is that based upon experimental data or calculated? So in this case, I'll sort of step through this a little bit. Um, this is calculated using a, a free energy minimization uh, program where um, we take a given bulk composition and say, you know, at this pressure and temperature at equilibrium, Right. What that, should that's the phase bond yes? That right. what, what 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 should be the mineralogy of that? And then from that, the last, and I'll show you how the second part of this goes. So the velocity is calculated rather than measured. Yeah, the I'll velocity. talk about this in the next couple of slides. But yes, but this is a prediction. Uh -huh. Now, for the next couple of slides, I'll try to explain why we would do it this way. Uh, are there experimental data that you can put on the the diagram to show how it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, there are, yes. Um, the first paper we wrote about this, we did a lot of calibration and calculation, and, you know, I'll, the next couple of slides actually get to some of these issues, so we can maybe get back to this, because these are good questions, is how real are these things, and why do we do it this way? Um, at, well, okay, this is another example of a thing that you might do with this. Um, there's been this long-standing discussion of, you know, how arcs are sort of the birthplace of continents, that the andesitic compositions that we heard about should look on average in some ways a lot like average composition of continents. But when you go and you look at seismic wave speeds, um, so these are velocities as a function of depth. Now mostly from active source experiments, um, many of these wind up being faster than sort of average wave speeds of continents. And so um, you know, trying to understand what this means for our composition and then by inference, you know, the processes by which you actually make continents different from arcs has been another thing that's been, you know, in order to do this, you have to understand what the compositions actually mean. Um, okay, so this is kind of, you know, the other way to do this. Um, for a long time, and people still do that. I mean, you pick up a rock and you identify its composition and then you take it into the lab and then you can send seismic waves or measure its elastic properties somehow. Um, and there's a, there's a pretty big literature in that. And from that, you know, this is showing just the P wave speeds for different rocks. This is one of these plots where it's like, one thing versus nothing because it's just a sorting. Um, 
But you know, you get the basic ideas, you know, eclogites and but, you know, you sort of you can see what's missing. It is actually there's no real peridotites up here for whatever reason. But um, you know, you get sort of fast stuff and things that should be slower. And then this is showing that you know these waves speeds correlate with the densities somewhat well. And this is sort of color, I think a lot of our inference about what we expect and how we interpret seismologies come from these studies. And these go back to, I don't know, the 40s or 50s when people first started to be able to do this. Um, there's a couple, and, and you know, this is still very valuable. If you have rocks that you understand that you want to you know, you know, is this rock resemble seismic waves in space? There's two problems that have emerged from doing this. One is, is that some petrologists will probably yell at me for saying this, but you know, every rock that's on the surface is on the surface. And at some scale, there are cracks. And at some scale, that you may not be able to see there's alteration. And the problem is that that introduces a bias. Both of those things will make wave speeds be slower than they would be if that same rock was down there at the pressure and temperature where the alteration products would be unstable, wouldn't exist, and the cracks would all be closed. So when people do comparisons between sort of what minerals ought to look like and what these rocks ought to look like. Sometimes they're close, but oftentimes the rocks are slower. So that's one reason why we wouldn't do it. And the other thing is that you know, you're know you only limited to the rocks that you have. And so if you think a particular composition is important somewhere in the Earth's interior, you know you can't access it. And, that, and that's kind of the motivation that's gotten us into this business of trying to predict velocities from mineralogy. Um, and sort of the and so the flow chart sort of looks like this: is that we somehow, either through imagination or looking at rocks in the field or these sort of thermodynamic um, equilibri equilibrium calculations, try to disaggregate the rock that we're interested in into the modal mineral abundances: how much uh, you know, forstroid and phthalate and this pyroxene and this garnet is in there. Um, the reason we do that is because there's a lot that's been learned over the years about elastic properties of minerals. And so then we can take <coughs> this mineral assemblage, calculate, so yeah, oh yeah, K is bulk modulus, G is uh, shear modulus, maybe V could be volume, uh, I forget, and then we can look up its derivatives, and from that extrapolate a given pressure and temperature, what the elastic properties are, have some sort of model then that lets us aggregate these back into a crystalline mixture that looks like a rock and come up with some predictions of velocities. Um, and that's kind of the basic thing. I'm going to step you through this a little bit because, uh, I mean, this underlies a lot of what we're doing. Um, if you want a toy to do this yourself, we keep rewriting this, but we have a recent both Excel and MATLAB version of a toolbox that has a library of mineral elastic properties and some tools to let you do this aggreg aggregation. And you can probably throw the, the supplement you just download and has all the software in it. Um, things like this, you know, you can do with, so these are showing the variation of, I think, different minerals or what we're doing in this case is we're calculating ranges of compositions. I think in this case we're going from pure <laughs> a magnesium to you know, 80% magnesium, 20% iron, and looking at variations in olivines at two different temperatures, uh, different pyroxenes and some, I forget what the subset of garnets are. But you can sort of see that you know, the range in say P velocities, in this case looking at the ratio of P to S velocities for these different minerals. And so this is like a lot of what can go in there. Um, it's worth pointing out quartz is a very strange mineral. It sits, it, it's um, it almost, it is a, at shallow conditions or low temperatures uh, alpha quartz sort of behaves like a spring. If you squeeze on it, it doesn't puff out. It has a Poisson's ratio that gets very close to zero. And if you think about it, I'll show an example of this in a minute, but you know, crustal rocks that have a lot of quartz in them get very sort of mucked up by what that could do. But um, So the sort of parameters that you need, density, bulk modulus, shear modulus, 
their derivatives and more complicated derivatives. These are the sorts of things that, you know, there's different ways of doing this, but in some reasonable thermodynamically consistent way, we sort of know how to extrapolate through certainly all subduction zone conditions. And we can argue about the deep mantle and what's the right, you know, when pressures get really high. Um, the last step is aggregating. There's a bunch of different mixture theories that are out there. Um, this gets complicated. I'll start from the bottom. Um, the data sets of mineral properties that are isotropically averaged somehow are much bigger than data sets that include, you know, full characterizations of mineral anisotropy. And so, you know, and I think this is one of the things that is probably still needs a lot of work on, but you know, the assumption is that we sort of averaged over mineral orientations in sort of the simple calculations that I'm going to show you. Um, you want to keep anisotropy in the back of your head. So there's a couple of different ways to think about how to do these mixtures and how to put bounds on the mixtures. You get uh, elastic moduli, and then through the usual formulas get seismic velocities. This is just showing what you know, some of these mixture theories do. In this case, we're going from first straight to failite and showing kind of what the shear wave velocities would be. And this is mixing sort of a lurzolite and a serpentinite with overall sort of analogous compositions. These bands show what the mixture theories do. Again, this is not worrying about the anisotropy effects. This is just sort of having different minerals in different portions doing different things. Phil. So you're, I, th this is answering one, my first question, which was, you know, how do these various averaging schemes um, compare? But what about taking the end, so you're taking Voight Royce Hill, which is an average. What if you compare oh, Voight and yeah. Royce? So, so yeah, the top is Voight and the bottom is Royce of the red bound. So this is, what, what you're basically doing is like you're averaging the um, elastic moduli on one side or averaging one over the elastic moduli or the compliances on the other side. So that's the red range. And then this other mixture theory, which I've never really understood as well as I probably should. This, I can't even pronounce it. This is the Hessian Strickman thing. Um, you know, Gives lower. There, 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 there is an argument why it's reasonable. Better. It's the blue lines, and they give tighter bounds. I, you know, but all this information, you know, you can have. It. I mean, again, this is all assuming isotropic mixtures. So that's kind of the little bugaboo that you want to keep in the back of your head. But that's kind of how this works, right? So then, then you can make a rock. Um, this is just the table of the sixty minerals and the umpteen elastic parameters that allow you to do these calculations. Um, and, and that's kind of the way that we've been approaching this problem of infer, uh, uh, comparing composition to seismic velocities. And again, you know, there's a lot more rows to this than things a seismologist can possibly measure, right? So what? P wave velocities. There's S wave velocities. And uh, is there something else? But anyway, so even, you know, you have to think about what you're doing. Um, this is that same figure showing now, back to where this comes from, showing temperature and pressure. This is for this, another way, you know, maybe a geophysicist way of thinking about petrology is turning it into one number. In this case, this is uh, weight percent H2O bound in the mineral structure uh, for this hydrated, uh, metabasalt, uh, actually the more bulk composition plus um, water to saturation. So, you know, you get, yeah, there's a lot of water you can hold in these rocks at low temperatures. And you can see that there is at least some correlation between the waters and the seismic velocities. Um, yeah, I guess you know, as a geophysicist, I find this a much better way to think about petrology than those names of minerals you have. But I guess I'm missing something. Um, and so from this then, you know, and a number of people have sort of taken this approach, you can do things like, um, for example, start to ask questions about crustal composition. This is from a study that Mark Bain and Peter Kellerman have done where they've taken samples from exposed arc sections, so starting with real rocks, looking at them to figure out the modal mineralogy in those rocks, and then using this approach to go back and figure out, well, then they take that, or they take the bulk composition in a lot of these cases and do some sort of, again, 
thermodynamic free energy minimization to figure out what mineralogy ought to be if that composition was down at a given pressure and temperature, and then go through this process to figure out wave speeds. So they're not just measuring the velocities in the rocks, although they could, but um, because of these problems, this, this has been better. And you, know, and you can see things, like you still get this nice correlation between velocity and density. Um, in this paper, they make a big deal about how this is silica against P wave velocity at sort of the more mafic end. There's a huge range in velocities that you would see depending on aspects. So obviously, there's other things in silica that must be important here. And so their inference is that the silica, that P velocities were not a wonderful indicator of composition. But of course, you look at the other end of this curve, you know, the more silicic things, and you get more about 55% silica on up, is a pretty good correlation. And this is, I would, I, I think this is mostly when quartz becomes stable in appreciable abundance in certain rocks, it has a very strong control on the velocities because it's so much slower, at least the bulk modulus, than everything else. And you can also think about you know, density and VPVS and what's telling you about that. But, um, so from this, you can learn some things about crust. This is an estimate of lower crustal velocities from uh, Donna Shillington's thesis in the offshore of the central Aleutians. And so you know, you've know you learned something about the composition of the crust from that, and presumably the densities. Um, oh yeah, I just I put a couple of these up because we've been talking about Mount St. Helens. We have this big project. Um, and uh, showing you some of the other results. This is an image, a cross section, east-west cross section. Uh, through Mount St. Helens, Mount Adams, so this is you know, plus 100 kilometer long section, where we're looking at seismic wave speeds as inferred by ambient noise tomography. And these, this technique is mostly sensitive now to shear waves, not to P waves. They have different sensitivities to material properties. And I, I'm not going to get too much into this. So what you know, we see is that in the mid-crust, as Mount St. Helens, things get much slower to the east than they do to the west. Um, and the question, you know, are these, you know what, is, what does red mean? Uh, well, if, let's skip this one for now. But I, mean, I think you know, if you look at for that same Bain, and there's actually an update of that Bain Kellerman database that I did with Olivier Jaguz, um, silica correlates quite differently with shear velocities than with p velocities because of, um, well, minerals behave differently. And uh, in particular, that strong correlation between velocity and silica that you see down here for p waves goes away um, because the shear modulus of quartz is a lot like the shear modulus of a lot of other minerals that, you know, feldspars and so on that are common. Um, it's just the bulk modulus is what's strange. And so you don't have that kind of sense. You might have more sensitivity at lower silica contents. Um, the two dashed lines here, this is sort of the average wave speed that we see in here. It's about 3.7, 3.75 kilometers a second. This is 3.9 to 4 kilometers a second. And you can see that you know there's a lot that could be there. Um, none of these velocities are particularly unusual for a wide range of crustal compositions. Um, and so you know one inference is that most of this change may just have to do with lithology. And there's some suggestion you know, that there's <coughs> argue with Brandon about this. But you know, is this where, say, the, there's a mafic uh, terrain, the Siletsia sits off here, and maybe it peters out here, and you start to get into sort of um, <coughs> other materials that are caught up in its collision with North America. Um, that also makes us wonder, you know, some of the variation in velocity between the crust and the mantle that suggests a uh, cold, uh, you know, a very serpentinized wedge, at least some of that velocity variation looks like it's actually might be due to the crustal composition changes. Not all of it, about half. So, but we're, we're, um, so these are the kinds of things that we can start to do. We can start to say this is nothing super unusual. We don't see like, a, we don't need a big body of magma to explain these kinds of variations. The rocks can do most of it for us. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, this is, we've had all this data for about eight months in our hands. And so, 
the next step is a joint inversion. I mean, the receiver function image is like this, and then there's joint inversions that you can do to sort of get what, what the, the surface wave stuff is bad at, the ambient noise, is finding sharp boundaries there. Fre each frequency measures some integrated velocity in the Earth, and so you get something smooth out. And, and so, right, we can piece this together a little bit more. Um, and yeah, and where this is going, and I don't think we've gotten there yet, but, you know, is a sort of question of what, here's again Mount St. Helens, Mount Adams. This is one of these famous thermal models that Peter bashed incessantly yesterday. That oh. <laughs> I am. I was just saying you bashed this. I, we're putting, anyway, so this is the one that's appropriate, more or less, for this section, and, you know, um, this is this famous cold corner. If this was fully hydrated, uh, we can do the same sort of procedure and say we add water to some peridotite. What is the phase assemblage is stable? What are the velocities? And we can make images like this. So this is showing, these are contours now of S-wave velocity. 4.4, 4, 4.2, 4 kilometers a second. Um, Christy will be happy to see this big blob here is where chlorite is stable, but serpentine is not. <laughs> and then serpentine would kick in up here. Um, and so, you know, so this gives us some targets. We have this prediction from here, and then we have, you know, these kind of, you know, this kind of measurements from up here. We're having a hard time actually imaging directly the velocity in there because it's such a small target. Um, so, but we're, the hope is to be able to, you know, really say how much of this moho fading out thing is really serpentinization or not. This, though, I mean, an important implicit assumption in this velocity prediction is that the enough water has gotten into here to fully hydrate it. And there's a lot of water in here, and we'll, if we have some time at the end, I can sort of talk you through how, although this is something that is maybe reasonable in Cascadia, in most colder subduction zones, um, it's actually hard to get enough water in a reasonable amount of time to do this to four arcs. Um, what else? Oh yeah, so there's, you also can see in this model there's like streaks here because we're worrying about the subducting crust. Uh, Peter and Paul I think showed different versions of, Peter and Paul, this is a little creepy. Um, uh, showing uh, different versions of things like this. This is showing now for the, these same thermal models where we put on the petrologic, you know, Brad Hacker's petrologic calculations, the, in this case, I'm not worrying about the facies, but the geophysically like, understandable concept of how much water is in. Uh, in this case, there's sediments and altered oceanic crust and this little serpentine layer that Paul talked about. This is showing what that same structure looks like when converted to shear wave velocities. And that gives us an, a target to look for where, you know, a little bit of water in some gabbro will actually do quite a bit to slow it down. Um, and so we would expect to see transitions at, down, you know, a transition from something that's slow to something that's not so slow down at depths at around 60, 70 kilometers. <laughs> Layer, number. So yes, it ex vertically exploded. Um, this, so this is depth normal to the slab surface is a good way to think about it. So we've taken this slab, we've flattened it out, and we've exploded it so we can see what the velocities would be. And the reason for doing this is because you know, these things that look at layers, like the receiver functions and the guided waves, are sensitive to these boundaries, really. They're showing us contrast across them. You know, these, this is sort of how you want to think about looking at this. This is the migrated receiver function image that sort of would go with this. And you can see, um, this is one from the nearby cafe line, but you know, the yeah, Bostock's image as far as south looks similar. This is a bright red thing that is arguably of a thickness similar to this package going down that doesn't disappear entirely, but becomes a lot less bright red at around the depths where these models would predict. So this is sort of has been sort of one of the primary arguments that we are actually able to see, um, you know, the metamorphism of <coughs> the, you know, gabbroic or basaltic oceanic crust as it reaches higher temperatures and pressures. And we compare that with that Alaska image I showed earlier where we see red stuff down to 120, 130 kilometers. That makes sense if you start to think about the different temperature paths. So that's kind of the game that we're playing here. Um, let me see. I should... I'm going to, well, 
a couple of quick words about anisotropy. Um, I'm gonna skip anisotropy. Sorry, it's 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 really complex. I'll, I'll leave this one up. Um, anisotropy was it's gotten very complicated in subduction zones because you don't see something. You know, there there's a bunch of different things people have seen in a bunch of different subduction zones. There's a bunch of different places in subduction zones that could produce fabric, and there are a bunch of different <laughs> mechanisms that. Um, might be causing the fabric in terms of different dislocations in olivine, uh, serpentinite lenses, so on. And um, it's just, I, I, I've been surprised how little this has been discussed at this meeting so far. Um, I think that is partly reflecting the fact that what seemed like a great tool 15 years ago has gotten to be a very complicated one. And um, if there is, doesn't mean it's not worth pursuing, but it's gotten to be too complicated for me, I think. Um, <coughs> all right, so all of those calculations are good in a regime where uh, material's fairly far away from probably good way to think it's solidus or you know temperature is about 800,000 degrees C. Beyond that. Um, the seismic wave speeds start to be affected by um, what we call physical dispersion. I'll explain that in a minute. But um, basically, it's the attenuation of seismic waves has starts to be increasingly important in what we see. Um, Doug, I think, showed explained attenuation, but basically. Signals travel through, they lose energy. As they do so, you can quantify sort of the loss of energy. And the important thing is we usually quantify this in energy loss per cycle. So higher frequencies have a lot more cycles and lose more energy than lower frequencies if that rate is the same. You can see that. This is a spectrum of an S wave. This is just background noise. And this is signal. This is, gosh, this is from some, one of those earthquakes in Nicaragua. But you can see this sort of on this log amplitude versus frequency, this linear fit, which you know, is exactly what this kind of model of amplitude decay would predict, where the amplitude decays is the frequency, pi times the travel time divided by some quality factor q. That q is the thing that parameterizes the attenuation. So the bigger the q, the faster this rate of it's slower, this rate. The higher the quality. This is an annoying thing that some ancient seismologists did was define attenuation with a number that's its inverse. And um, I at least goes back to Knopoff 64, who wrote the paper with the shortest title ever. Yes, right? <laughs> um, and we can go, uh, you know, and after hanging out with too many petrologists for a long time, I made a diagram with P and T, but put attenuation mechanism on this. I was sort of thinking about it's not, these aren't metamorphic facies, but they kind of look like them. And you know, this is probably uh, is a very simplified way of thinking about this. But um, basically, at, at low temperatures and pressures, thermally activated processes aren't important. But then cracks and pores can be really big. And so there's a huge amount of attenuation that can happen uh, through porosity. And sedimentary basins light up on Q maps. Um, as you get to higher temperatures and closing the pores, the dominant mechanism, and the main thing that we talk about, is we call this high temperature background, high temperature dissipation process. As you get near to and cross the solidus, melt starts to become important. And a good question is, you know, what kinds of things control attenuation, if anything does, in this other mechanism? And the polycrystalline thermoelasticity is sort of weird things start to happen if you have minerals with different coefficients of expansion and compressibilities and waves pass through. Um, on top of all of this, of course, what we actually see is the decay in amplitude and seismic waves. And what contributes to that as well as sort of these intrinsic energy loss problems is scattering. That is the part of the wave that doesn't just go straight, but sort of bounces around. And so if you look at just a small piece of the wave, at least some part of the energy will show up later or get thrown off somewhere else. And that's always something to keep in mind. Um, yeah. Green 
green is, there's no units on either axis. Um, there's a solidus drawn on here. So, um, uh, you know, my, my, I, I would you know, say somewhere in here is, you know, where your pressure is high enough for cracks to close. That's kind of how I think about this. So upper to middle crust, depending on your, yeah. This is green? So yeah, the idea is this is a regime where, it's sort of yellowish to me, but um, where, um, yeah, the idea is you know, this is where um, cracks and pore, poroelastic effects dominate attenuation. In oh, in the earth. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. That, so I, 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 my, that my different places it could be different things, right? So if you're sitting along a thrust zone at depth and you think this is you know high pressure, high porosity, you still may see some of this effect leaking up into that, but. Um, I'm putting this on a PT diagram. Is not this is just this is a conceptual thing here. This isn't like trying to think of. But the important point to get to is that you know you could expect in hot mantle to see a lot of these high temperature background processes kick in in mantle depths. Um, if you're sitting in a slab, though, it's not so obvious that these processes would even be important. And that's where this 800 to 1,000 degree boundary is in mantle conditions, probably. Um, first, I want to say a few things about physical dispersion. I'll get back to the mechanisms that cause this. Um, just so that this is something, this is one that seismologists know, have to learn about. Um, Doug asked me if I was going to teach about the kramers kronig relations. And um, there is math behind this that <laughs> we'll skip, right? But um, basic idea is that if you're doing this to a signal, you're, I've changed my f to omega, which is 2 pi f, it's still the frequency. But if you're doing this to a signal, you're removing more energy from the higher frequencies. You know, if you just take a spike and put it into you know, some little program that does this, it'll make a broader pulse. The problem is, is that you know, where zero was here, this, if you think of this as a signal that's traveling, a P wave, this thing shows up at the time that the wave can that the Earth can send information elastically. If you just take this and fatten it, you're getting all of this signal coming before the energy should be able to get to you. So there's a causality problem. And this gets worse and worse the more you do this attenuation. And so the fix is that we don't just change amplitudes, we also change phase, so that the right way to draw this pulse would be more like that, where the higher frequencies would still show up at that high frequency wave time, but the lower frequencies get progressively delayed. And the kramers kronig relations tell us exactly how that happens. And we can plug these in. Um, but um, what this means practically, though, is as attenuation becomes important, you start to see effects on seismic velocities, particularly at lower frequencies. Lower frequencies start to travel slower because of this effect, independent of what the solid does. As temperature increases, then both of these things are happening, right? As, as temperature increases, you're weakening the material, and the bulk and shear modulus are kind of getting mushier. And so even at high frequencies, the signals are going slower. But then you're also attenuating, so at low frequencies, they're going even slower. And so both of these things add up. Um, and uh, there's a figure here that's not here yet. Hang on. Where's my mouse? Well, it'll come up in a minute. Nope, it won't. Um, so, yeah, so I, I, hopefully later this will show up. Or, I, know, I don't know where it was. It was back here, right? If I go back to having issues here with all of this, the very beginning of this, here. So, something happened on my way to the podium, I guess. But um, what's plotted here are the bulk and shear moduli that you would expect at the function of temperature. At low frequencies, these things follow as a roughly linear trend. That's from this anharmonic effect of the bulk and shear modulus getting mushier and mushier. Real seismic waves at real frequencies, these different colors are higher and lower frequencies, are being slowed down even more at the high temperature end because of this physical dispersion effect. And when you get up to temperatures near solidus, this physical dispersion effect can be bigger than sort of this other effect. And those spreadsheets that made this 
don't take that into account. So you have to sort of think about this separately. Um, all right, sorry about that. There's why that figure vanished, I don't know, but. Okay, so now you understand that. And now we need to go back and understand what attenuation really does and where this comes from. Um, we saw some of this, or relatives of this, in Phil's talk. Um, there, but there have been a series of experiments done over the last 20 years or so where people have measured seismic attenuation in laboratory samples, um, almost entirely in olivine, or things that are dominated by olivine. But they're able to do this at seismic frequencies, periods of a second, 10 seconds, 100 seconds, and temperatures that are you know, relevant to mantle con ambient mantle conditions. This has been a great advance. Uh, I'd say most of this work, or maybe all of it, has happened at Ian Jackson's lab at ANU. Um, these are incredibly difficult things to do. You have to find ways to get very slow, low frequency uh, deformation to happen to samples that are you know, not very big. Um, without having a lot of other problems. And so, you know, and this is showing uh, two of these ANU lab model fits to all their data. Uh, the red line is from McCarthy 2011. That's a, fit, that's a different way of thinking about how to model these data and some other data from the Tokyo group. And, you know, but all of these things are showing surprising consistency at sort of laboratory conditions. The important extrapolation between laboratory conditions and mantle conditions is grain size. Probably, you know, these things are all done. You saw a few microns, and we can talk about it, but, you know, millimeter to centimeter kind of sizes are what we imagine, or we, it's a good reason to think happen in the lab. And so I've been trying to think of, you know, how do you get a handle on this, but they all show this fairly strong dependence of attenuation on temperature as you go through kind of this, you know, above a thousand degree range. Um, so that gives us a handle on what could be. Um, the first thing we can do is just using this general knowledge that there is this huge temperature dependence on attenuation, we can then look at attenuation tomography. We can, you know, there's ways of measuring, making maps of attenuation. And, and you know, I think this provides some of the best sort of ancillary data for this idea that, say, subduction zones have cold noses. This is showing six different studies in different parts of the world where, you know, they all kind of look like this. There's a slab, there's an arc, and then right about where the slab reaches, 80-ish kilometers depth, there's this sharp transition in the wedge for something that's very red that's highly attenuating to something that's really not attenuating at all, and that we can interpret as yeah, a very strong change in temperature. These things where we can compare them are very consistent with those heat flow measurements that Peter showed. So this has been kind of one of the drivers behind having all of these subduction zone models that kept this cold corner down to about 80 kilometers depth, you know, right? 75, 85, I can't quite see that one, but you, know, you can go around and see that, that this actually seems to be a fairly robust feature in a lot of the planet. Um, there's the figure, sorry, this one. Slip to uh, da, 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 da. so we can model these things together. Um, one of the things that sort of yeah, um, one of the things that comes out of this though, out of all the laboratory studies, is that there actually should be a weak frequency dependence to attenuation. Um, in this case, so that's frequency, that's Q alpha of around 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. Uh, there's a lot of reasons physically I think that should happen. Um, there's been a very hard thing seismologically to see. If you sort of think about this, if Q varies its frequency in a simple way, and that's a small number, then the amplitude, which looks like this, is going to go as something like F to the 1 minus alpha. So it's a low, something slightly off of 1. Um, that manifests itself in these curves of frequency versus log of amplitude as some curvature. And you, you know, there have been a couple of attempts to try to see this, and they seem to be a little bit happier at non-zero curvatures and zero curvatures. Um, but this has been an uh, important prediction from laboratory studies that I think helps us, you know, we'd like to be able to see a little bit more clearly to feel like, you know, this is really the right way to think about the attenuation. Um, all right, so what's going on? Well, of course, like everything, there is, you know, 
10 or 20 experimentalists who worked on this problem, and I think there's at least 30 different opinions about what actually is happening. But I mean, it's sort of an interest. Yeah, a lot of this has sort of gone back to sort of grain scale processes, and it's like an interesting thing. You know, you sort of think seismic waves are seeing these big images over tens of kilometers, and outcrop people see outcrop size, and then you know, experimentalists see stuff at this size. But, but this suggests there's a really tight linkage between the grain scale stuff and the seismic wave stuff. Um, and most of the models for how attenuation work basically in this high temperature regime have to do with sliding and motion along grain boundaries. This is from some Ben Holtzman cartoons who does beautiful drawings of this sort of thing. Um, but the idea is, is that you know, as a seismic wave passes, the, there's some shear, there's some gradients and stress that pushes these causes grains to slide past each other. They can't because there's other grains in the way. Um, that produces pressure changes from one side of the grain boundary to the other. That induces some diffusive transport of material. And it's that diffusion that is absorbing the energy. And that's sort of what's making the attenuations. These things are sliding past each other. And so the faster or slower this diffusive pathway goes, the more the attenuation should be. And then, but this gets really interesting, because these are also the same, these are very related to the physical processes that produce steady state creep, that produce a lot of the rheologies. And so it suggests that there's this linkage between the seismic attenuation and steady state creep. And this has been probably most strongly advocated uh, by this paper, uh, well, <coughs> a series of papers out of, oh, shoot. Uh, this is from Christine McCarthy's uh, work with Yasuko Takei uh, from the um, University of Tokyo group, where they've taken a bunch of different materials and substances and have shown over wide ranges of frequencies that the relationship between steady state creep and seismic attenuation looks about the same. The way that they do that is they take the frequencies that they're deforming something and normalize them by the Maxwell frequency. So from one of those you know, standard linear solids that Phil showed yesterday, there's, you can figure out what that natural period is. That depends on the viscosity of the material, and that's, which is the steady state creep rate. And they argue if you do that, this includes dots from three different sets of olivine experiments from labs at Brown and Minnesota and ANU, and then a study using Borneol, which is mothballs, basically, and showing that even over this huge range of elastic parameters, you know, look the same. And so the idea is that at very low end of this normalized frequency, you're in a steady state creep regime. The slope should be minus one. And that in here somewhere, maybe you're in the attenuation regime. This green box was moved from where I had put it. The problem, this highlights, though, the problem is that if you go through these normalizations, Again, you know, the big thing that they're doing is they're doing experiments on very small grain samples, seismic frequencies normal in mantle conditions sort of normalized out here. So there's some big extrapolation. And so whether or how easily you can extrapolate these to here has been the subject of a lot of debate lately. But if you buy this basic principle, that means that you can take sort of relatives of the creep laws that, you know, that like Hearth and Kolstad put together you saw yesterday, and use those or the structure of those as a proxy for how attenuation might be affected by things that are, you know, experimentally been very difficult to test, like effects of water and effects of melt. And so this is, you know, the, written, so in this case you think of attenuation as a function of this, something that looks like this, there's an Arrhenius term with pressure and temperature and something about melt and something about grain size and something about water content and so on. Now this is kind of how um, we'll sort of go forward to think about how all of this works. There are some problems. The grain size extrapolation Jeff, is a huge one. You yeah. have to wrap up pretty soon. Oh, okay. yeah, 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 okay. Um, yeah, grain size extrapolation is a huge problem. Um, you know, talk about all the funny things start happening at high frequencies that they don't understand. Different labs have come up with different things, but, but you know, um, all of this uh, gives us then a tool for looking both at attenuation for its own sake as a way to sort of understand how some of these physical mechanisms work and then sort of doing these corrections to velocities. And so the last bit I just want to do, and I think 
Probably like five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. Um, you know, how do you? Um, one example of something that you might want to do is to try to understand what seismic waves are telling you about water in the Earth. And you know, there's three ways you can hide water in the Earth. Um, you can hide this in hydrous minerals, which we've already talked about how to look at that. We understand mineral elasticity. Um, you can hide this as hydrogen in nominally anhydrous minerals. Um, and for that, the rheology analogies have been a very useful way of kind of trying to understand what attenuation might be. Or there's pore fluids, and that's what you know, we haven't really talked much about. Um, you can skip over. This is just repeating stuff from earlier about hydrous phases and how they affect velocities. Um, water as impurities in olivine is an interesting thing, because I mean, we saw it, it, it slow, it, you know, um, water hangs out in defects and weakens, uh, reduces viscosities by perhaps orders of magnitude. But it also promote, probably promotes grain growth. And there's a lot of ways you can model that. But this is an example where this is that same figure of Corrado showing sort of that Doug showed earlier. But this is showing a model of attenuation versus water content, where we've tried to take into account both this rheological weakening and because attenuation seems to depend on grain size, the, fact, the grain growth model, in this case it's the Austin Evans paleo watt meter model that um, tries to account for the fact that you know, more water will speed up diffusion, which will make grains get bigger. These two effects, in this, in this case, almost cancel each other out, depending on exactly how we do this. Um, and so we've been feeling more and more that this is actually not a very easy way Looking at seismic wave speeds is not a very easy way to look at water in at least this kind of atoms loose. Um, all I want to say about water in pores is that it's very complicated and depends on pore geometry. This is from a study, an earlier study that uh, Yusuko Takei did, where she was a sort of a modeling effort, but looking at different shapes of pores, different contrasts in the bulk modulus between the fluids and the solids, and you know. You can calculate a wide range, and this is like changes in p velocity relative to s velocity, showing that sometimes they're above one, sometimes they're below one. So, in other words, if you add, and this is sort of a little bit easier way to think about it, if you add fluids, depending on the pore geometry and the physical properties of the melt, you can cause VPVS to go up or down and do a bunch of different things depending on these pore geometries. This is, I think, one of the reasons why when Doug says, um, a seismologist who tells you x percent uh, <coughs> velocity changes, y percent melt is probably pulling your leg. I forget what you said, but anyway, well, they might be pulling their own leg. But you know, it's, it is a complicated problem. And I think this is something that we don't really have a good handle on yet, and is worth more work. Um, a related problem is there is at least some literature that suggests very, very small melt fractions, fractions of a percent, have a big change on viscosity and then by inference on attenuation. And this can, you propagate this through, can give you pretty big changes in velocity for just being very close to the solidus. Um, other things I don't think we have any handle on a lot, sort of larger scale sort of segregation and banding and melting. How does this behave to seismic waves? I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. Um, I will skip over this because I'm running out of time. Um, just kind of close by just sort of showing, you know, one last picture. This is then taking, you know, a bunch of these different models for attenuation. Um, comparing them to data sets that we have from those different attenuation models, where we have, in this case, we're plotting attenuation below volcanic arcs in the hottest parts of the wedge on this axis, and temperature, in this case, independently tested by um, petrologic estimates from the lavas that are coming out. And you can argue about both these axes. There is a weak trend. Overall, all of these models show the same trend, but they're predicting much, much higher attenuations by about a factor of three or four. The same process works just fine in, say, old ocean lithosphere. These are surface wave models, and these are the same models. So there's something that's different you know, about what's going on underneath arcs. And of course, the obvious thing is there are volcanoes, and we're seeing a signature of melt. This just, I sort of put this up, sort of point to, the more we can do to try to understand this, I think the signature of melt on seismic wave speeds, I think the easier it'll be to start to make sense out of these images we're seeing. So I'm just going to go to the end there. And
Try to let you guys Thank have lunch. Thank you. So we have uh, questions from the uh, students and postdocs. When in the seismological measurement, when you correlate the mineralogy velocity or the parameters, how you are confident this velocity? Means that these are the absolute velocity. So. The, uh, when you compare the mineralogical model and the seismological things, the mineral, so what is the error bar like a body wave if you are doing all these converging phases? You mean the errors in the seismology or the errors in? Error in the seismology the and uh, maybe we can unpredict the mineralogy because if you have a large error. Well, I have, my seismic measurements are always perfect, right? <laughs> uh, no, you know, it, it, it's like any of these things. I, 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 it, depends entirely on how you're making the measurement, you know, what the data set looks like, where in your model you are. Um, and that was sort of part of the rant at the beginning was that sort of emphasized that you know, things can get lost, say, in complicated tomographic models, but there are data that go behind those. And if you can find that and pull them out, you can often do better. I mean, there's cases where, you know, People feel like they can get you know, deep mantle average velocities over big scales to within a percent or two. You know, here we're seeing these contrasts between, say, a subducting crust and mantle in some places to within you know a few percent, and we're happy with that. Um, but you know, often, it, but it depends a lot on the study. I and mean, sometimes it's just you know the fact that you see something at all or you don't see something, and then you have to sort of think like, what's the error bar on that? Is sort of what's helpful. I, that's, that's a, probably a better question for Brandon in his talk, actually. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah, I guess with your um, calculated seismic velocities, and then when you compare them, kind of going back to the first question, when you're comparing them to values in the literature, you kind of throw away the literature because of cracks and stuff, which understandable. But are you able to, like, maybe the experimentalist can answer this, but can you measure the seismic velocities, like, in high pressure temperature experiments, and then compare those to your data? I, I mean, I'm, I sort of went this route because it's, uh, you know, you have this internal self consistency and freedom as well as that problem. But certainly, you know, a lot of cases people have tried to do these comparisons because you would want to, you know, and. Yeah, usually you start jacking up the pressures on your samples and the cracks close and you start to approach these velocities within some bounds. Um, a lot of, say, what we know about, say, real anisotropic fabrics in the Earth has come from those kinds of measurements where, you know, you have to both worry about the individual minerals and how well they're organized and that's, you know, the organization is a very hard thing to do from first principles, but you know, you have natural samples to look at. You can kind of work with this. So, you know, I think that's, that's been one place where that's been super useful. Um, and, you know, for upper crustal rocks where the velocities are varying hugely, there's still a lot to be learned by measuring velocities in those rocks. Sure. Is there any other students? Who Actually, uh, to follow up on that, could you just comment real quickly on technically how um, how seismic velocities are measured in the lab uh, on frequencies that are relevant to the Earth and on samples that aren't like kilometers long. Does that make sense? Like yeah, yeah. No, I mean like mo most most of the, most of the database is ultrasonic. Is most of the database is ultrasonic of those elastic velocity. You know, the traditional you know Nick Christensen things. And so you're talking you know megahertz frequencies. So the wavelengths are short compared to the sample size. You can get away with it. Um, that works as long as you're out of this physical dispersion regime, right? And you don't have to worry about <coughs> weird poroelastic effects. Um, the other sorts of things get really complicated. You know, that sort of like weird torsion machine that Phil has in his lab. I mean, that's like, so Ian Jackson's big machine does various combinations of very slowly doing this and very slowly doing that to measure. Um, effectively elastic moduli, complex elastic moduli, 
by looking at you know, subtle phase shifts between the forcing and the response. And, and those are the really hard things to do. Cool, thanks. So, <clears throat> Jeff, you showed uh, some of those plots where you flattened the slab to show the progression um, mm -hmm. of the phase changes. So, in, in one of the images, there's serpentinite still for a little bit while the crust has uh, fully transformed into a higher velocity phase. Is there anywhere in the world we can target to try to see uh, a low velocity layer associated with the serpentinite phase, especially with some of these estimates that are now saying that right, maybe there's you know 40% serpentinization and like five or 10 kilometers below the crust? I, where's my mouse? There it is. Um, all right, so this is similar, I, yeah, I mean, I guess this came up in Paul's talk too, right? Um, how do you, I just want to pop up this figure to talk in front of it, but um, let's see. Uh, you know, so a couple of things. Um, Right, so uh, you know, this, this is a Cascadia tune model, so everything bakes off pretty quickly. Um, there's a lot of questions, is that you know, this is assuming that there's enough water to make the serpentine down to some depth offshore. In Cascadia, the depth of serpentine stability at the trench, it's only seven, eight million year old crust, is, is really close to the Moho, and you know, some of the modern Act, recent active source data suggests that you don't see a lot of evidence for this. So there's those kinds of questions to begin with. You know, how this is a model. We've just put in some numbers. How much is that real? Um, this would probably be, well, the best and the worst place. The best place in that, because Paul can tell you that you have to get water from there because you can't get it from there, um, from the ARC stuff. But, you know, these older, colder subduction zones are places where you could imagine a much thicker pile of this continuing much deeper. And what happens that once you get past the cold nose, this stuff is all heating from above, so you're going to be cooking off the stuff from the top. I would say, though, you know, what else is implicit, what else is buried in these models is something like 0 0.7, 0 0.8 weight percent water in the gabbro section. Um, this is known from one or two ODP holes in some very strange places. Um, but and it's inferred based on some complicated chains of logic to happen in a lot of other places. But I think you know, it's a fair question is, you know, could you shove a very different amount of water in the crust? And then how would that look? Um, I don't know if I quite answered your question, but I guess colder places I would expect there to be more deeper serpentine. On here. Um, what styles of deformation or signatures of deformation would you look for that's consistent with a low frequency or a high frequency signature in laboratory experiments? Or is are there different types of deformation that are consistent with those different frequency signatures? I'm not sure exactly. You were discussing what you're like identify or in laboratory measurements. Um, some of your plots showed low frequency versus high frequency um, signatures. Maybe I'm not so, thinking of it the right way. I mean, sort of like on these master curves, sort of Q versus. So yeah. those are huge ranges in, in frequency. If you go back and look at, you know, the actual frequencies that the actual measurements are made at, you know, um, where that comes out actually. Now I think about it is, is so Phil showed these creep curves where there's a little transient and then this thing went straight there. So mm -hmm. that transient part was the higher, free, you know, is, is in some sense the higher frequency part of this and the straight part is the lower frequency part. So you're looking at right. kind of, it, it's sort of a different way of tearing apart that same sort of data, um, but, you know, over a much even wider frequency band. And so that's kind of what's motivated went into a lot of those lab measurements that we're trying to tie the low frequency, the creep part of deformation to this higher frequency analastic thing that makes attenuation. Yeah, it's likely, it's likely a spectrum of different processes that happen as you go from the transient to the steady state. It's not a single process here and a single yeah. process. Yeah. 
And it's, you know, I mean, this is, a lot of it's kind of, there's a little bit of experimental data, but there's a lot of reasons to think other things, yeah, very different things are happening. So I would sort of characterize this connection as more of a hypothesis right now than something that we rigidly know about. It's a useful hypothesis because it lets us leverage kind of things. Okay, Go, both of you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, based on what you said, based on my own experience working with Pascal, Santa was on. Well, I can hear you. Based on my own experience working with Pascal instruments, they are almost never calibrated, and uh, you know, in, in certain cases that we actually have to go to other people's sites and just dismantle their station and <laughs> claim them. So when you do the Q measurements and such, you know, what, what has been your experience? So, I mean, Q measurements are incredibly messy because you're looking at amplitude spectra, but the signals are enormous. We're looking at, you know, orders of magnitude changes in wave propagation. And, you know, again, you look at the raw seismogram, this is, is you know, when one earthquake recorded here, recorded there, and there's places that are just, you know, super rich in high frequency, and then it's just gone. So, I mean, you can worry about the sites, the ground underneath the stations, but, um, you know, these aren't subtle features of signals, really. Yeah, th there's no question. I mean, look at the yeah. earlier studies by, by Isaacs and, and, and such. But when you start doing tomography, you know that. Well, uh, I mean, it, it gets down to like how much of the tomography do you believe. But if you look at all of those Q tomography images that we showed, the difference between the hot mantle, or if it's the hot mantle edge and the cold nose, is at least an order of magnitude in Q. And what you see is that, you know, in some of these places, you've uh, you basically no sign that any energy is being lost at all. You're seeing, you know, up to, you know, 10, 20, 30 hertz, high frequency energy propagates at fork, and then nothing above three hertz is propagating through the mantle wedge. And that, that's a fairly typical contrast, often over fairly short geographic places. And yeah, if it's just like one seismometer, you don't do this, but these dense arrays that you put out, I mean, you can see these things in very organized ways. That's why someone asked about Peter with that other little faint red blob where the sample is like, well, you know, the little things that you don't have a lot of signal behind, you don't feel so great about. But this is, these are, you know, things like this cold nose are very first order, and the sample, because of there's so much attenuation underneath the arc, that number is actually, is fairly robust in the sense that you know, that, that, that um, the cues are so low that you're very sensitive to exactly what energy gets through. And that's really the dominant thing in the seismogram. I don't know if that kind of helps you. So uh, as you mentioned, if we had this meeting 10 or 15 years ago, this would have been all about seismic anisotropy. <laughs> Um, are, are we giving up on seismic anisotropy? I mean, is, <laughs> is that I, done? <laughs> you know, I, I, that was, I was probably very flip about this. Um, I think in subduction zones, it's just got, I mean, I've written papers about anisotropy. I, you know, it's fun when it works. Um, I think it's, it, yeah. Good, good. good. <laughs> Someone who's been working on this. I mean, you know, I think, you know, some of it has to do with being very careful about where these signals are traveling. Mechan I mean, mech and then, then there just these physical mechanisms that produce anisotropy, especially in the cold parts where other fabrics might be present, where, you know, minerals with enormous single crystal anisotropy, like serpentines and chloride, you know, might be abundant and organized enough. Um, I, I mean, I think, not that we should give up on this, but I, I think we're at a sort of point where we need to sort of step back a little bit and think, okay, you know, what can we really do with this tool? This, in this setting, at least, this hasn't been as simple as, you know, so I think some of the global things that, like, Doristan has worked on and so 